Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the last video, we looked at ways to predict the enthalpy of a chemical reaction using Hess's law and the enthalpies of formation of the reactants and products of the reaction. The problem is that those enthalpies of formation come from published data that were collected at standard temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius. What if we're looking at a reaction that happens at a different temperature? As we'll see today, that does make a difference. It turns out that we can account for the difference in temperature if we know the constant pressure heat capacities of all the reactants and products. You might remember that the constant pressure heat capacity can be expressed as the change in enthalpy as the temperature changes. As we saw in video 17, we can rearrange this equation a bit to get this. The change in enthalpy is just equal to the integral of the heat capacity with respect to the change in temperature. So here's how we use this. Suppose we want to know the enthalpy of this reaction at a temperature of 120 degrees Celsius. We can easily determine the enthalpy of the reaction at 25 degrees using data from a textbook. It's just the enthalpies of formation of the products minus the reactants. So imagine that we do perform the reaction at 25 Celsius. But once we've done that, imagine that we then perform a constant pressure process in which we raise the temperature from 25 to the temperature we're interested in, 120 degrees. The enthalpy of the system in that final state will just be the enthalpy of the reaction at 25 degrees plus the enthalpy change that took place during the constant pressure process. Remember, enthalpy is a state function, so the enthalpy in the final state is the same no matter how we got there. We could have done it using a constant volume, or adiabatic process too, but we'll imagine that we're using a two-step method of performing the reaction at 25 degrees Celsius, followed by a constant pressure process, because that's the easiest way to do the calculation. So the overall enthalpy is just the enthalpy at 25 degrees plus the enthalpy of the constant pressure process we use to get from that temperature to the desired one. We have this equation for the change in enthalpy at constant pressure. In the earlier video, we assumed that the heat capacity was constant because in that video we were just looking at gases that were expanding or contracting. This time, the material we're looking at is actually undergoing a chemical reaction, so it's unlikely that the heat capacities are going to be the same for the reactants and the products. That means we have to think about how the heat capacity will change during the reaction. Fortunately, we can determine that pretty easily if we know the heat capacities of all the compounds in the reaction. We can rewrite the integral so that the heat capacity is just the difference between the heat capacities of the products and the reactants. That's a constant for any particular reaction, so we can pop it out of the integral. When we solve the integral, we get this equation. The enthalpy at the final temperature is equal to the enthalpy at 25 degrees, which we can get from our textbook or another reference, plus the change in the heat capacities times the temperature change. Let's try that for our reaction. From the table in our textbook, we can find out that the change in enthalpy at 25 degrees is 311.2 kilojoules. To get the change in Cp, we need to look up the heat capacities for all the reactants and products. When we do that, here's the data we get. So we must add together the heat capacities of the products and subtract the heat capacities of the reactants. Notice that the units for the heat capacities are joules per Kelvin mole, so we'll need to multiply each heat capacity by the number of moles, which we get from the coefficients in the balanced reaction. When we do this, we find that the change in heat capacity is 49.11 joules per Kelvin. For the change in temperature, recall that a change of 95 Celsius is the same as a change of 95 Kelvin. When we plug these into our equation, we find that the enthalpy of our reaction at 120 Celsius is 315.9 kilojoules. But where is this change in enthalpy coming from anyway? 
Well, the heat absorbed or released from a reaction often comes from the bonds in the compounds. It turns out that ionic bonds are much stronger than covalent bonds, and we can see that when we look at properties like the melting point. So, for example, the melting point of sodium chloride is 804 degrees Celsius. But on the other hand, the melting point of glucose, which contains only covalent bonds, is much lower, 148 degrees Celsius. This is because, unlike glucose, ionic compounds are connected by strong ionic bonds. We can also make predictions about the strengths of different covalent bonds. For example, as you'd probably guess, triple bonds are much stronger than double bonds, and double bonds are stronger than single bonds. Exactly how strong are these bonds? The strength of many different bonds is summarized in this table. These are known as bond enthalpies, and the units here are kilojoules per mole. If you look carefully, you'll see that this table confirms some of the predictions we just mentioned. For example, you can see that a carbon-carbon single bond has a much lower enthalpy than a carbon-carbon double bond, and this in turn is lower than the enthalpy of a triple bond. We can use this data to help us get a good estimate of the enthalpy of a chemical reaction. For example, suppose we wanted to know the enthalpy of a combustion reaction, like that of methane, which is CH4. You might recall that in a combustion reaction, the second reactant is oxygen gas, and the products are carbon dioxide and water vapor. To find the enthalpy, we'll need to balance the reaction, so don't forget to do that. Now is where Lewis dot structures come in handy. In order to predict the enthalpy, we want to know what bonds these molecules have, so we'll need to draw the Lewis structures. By now you know how to draw these. Here's a picture of the Lewis structures in this reaction. As it turns out, in almost all chemical reactions, we break some bonds in the reactants and form new bonds to get the products. In order to break the bonds, we have to put in energy. And when we form new bonds, it usually releases energy. That means we can calculate the approximate enthalpy of a reaction by using this formula. The change in enthalpy is approximately equal to the enthalpies of the bonds we break minus the enthalpies of the new bonds we form. For example, look at the combustion reaction of methane again. In this reaction, we break all the bonds in the reactants and form all the new bonds in the product. If we look up the enthalpies of all those bonds, we can plug them into the formula to find out the enthalpy of the whole reaction. So let's look at the reactants first. The methane consists of four carbon-hydrogen single bonds, and the oxygen consists of an oxygen-oxygen double bond. Don't forget that the coefficient in the balance reaction tells us that we have two oxygen molecules. So altogether, we're breaking four CH single bonds, and two oxygen-oxygen double bonds. Meanwhile, on the product side, the carbon dioxide molecule has two carbon-oxygen double bonds, and the water has two oxygen-hydrogen single bonds. There are two water molecules, so altogether we're forming two CO double bonds and four OH single bonds. If we use the chart of bond enthalpies, we can plug the data into our equation. When we do, here's what we get. Don't forget to multiply the enthalpies by the number of moles of each kind of bond. When we perform the calculation, we get a result of negative 808 kilojoules, so this is a very exothermic reaction. That's exactly what we'd expect for a combustion reaction. So how does this compare to reality? Well, we already know how to accurately predict the enthalpy of a reaction. What we do is use Appendix C of the textbook to find the enthalpy of formation for each compound in the reaction. We get the overall enthalpy of the reaction using this formula, the enthalpies of the products minus the enthalpies of the reactants. So let's try that for our reaction. In Appendix C, we can see that our first product CO2 has an enthalpy of formation of negative 393.5 kilojoules. If we do this for all the products and reactants, here's what we get. Don't forget to multiply the enthalpies by the coefficients for the balanced reaction. When we perform the calculation, we get 
negative 802 kilojoules. That's pretty close to what we got using the bond enthalpies, which was negative 808 kilojoules. But why didn't we get exactly the same answer? To understand that, we just need to remember that the values in this chart are the average bond enthalpies. For example, the enthalpy of the CH single bond was calculated by looking at hundreds of different molecules that contain CH bonds and taking the average bond enthalpy for all of them. So that means all the values in this chart are approximations. On the other hand, the enthalpies in Appendix C aren't averages. Each one is the exact enthalpy for that particular compound. So the enthalpy you get by using Appendix C is much more accurate than the one that you get using bond enthalpies. Even so, as we saw earlier, the bond enthalpies still give a pretty good estimate. But that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll start looking at a whole new thermodynamic property, the entropy. It's one of the most important and challenging ideas in all of thermodynamics, and it'll give us a much greater insight into what makes some reactions possible and others impossible. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.